Hello and welcome to another video on Sodding channel. Today I'm gonna show how to configure my Emacs, so get ready. I'm recording that video on the stream, so if you wanna like join the future streams, you can follow me on Twitch slash Sodding, and I'm also... <laughs> And I'm also streaming on this YouTube channel. I'm making that video because once in a while I get asked about my Emacs configuration and my answer is always the same. I just give the link to my Emacs configuration repo so I keep my configuration in the GitHub repository on the GitHub. Um, I'm also gonna put the link in the description. And I do that because I cannot remember how I configured my Emacs. So th the point is, I just configured my Emacs and forget about it. So everything that I show on my streams is essentially like a muscle memory of my fingers. I just train myself to use my specific Emacs configuration and I don't remember how it works. It's like, it's like a ride in a bike. You don't think about how you ride the bike, you just ride the bike. And I don't know how I use my Emacs, I just use it. So I have an idea. I want to remove my Emacs configuration completely and start using the empty unconfigured Emacs. In that way, I will feel what is wrong and I will naturally try to reconfigure my Emacs to the state where I used to use it. And that will help me to show you how I actually configure my Emacs and how I actually use my Emacs. So it's going to be sort of an experiment. I don't know how it's going to go, if it's going to be useful for anybody, but I just want to try that. Okay, first of all, uh, we need to go and remove my Emacs configuration. So it's actually quite a kind of interesting, like probably any Emacs configuration starts with .emacs file. This is the file that is loaded up when you start your Emacs. Actually, it's not the only file that is loaded up when you start your Emacs. There are several of them, but I use mostly .emacs because, I don't know, for historical reasons, probably. And there are a couple of additional stuff, uh, like uh, .emacs.local, .emacs.rs, .emacs.snippets. Those additional folders are just my folders, uh, like folders of my configuration, where I just keep stuff organized. So they are not essentially something Emacs-specific, it's just my configuration. And as you can see, all of those files are sim links to other files, uh, they essentially lead to a folder where I keep my um, Emacs config configuration under version control. It's just an easy way to deploy my configuration from GitHub repo to my home system. I'm going to straight up remove everything. That's right, I'm removing everything. I'm going to restart my Emacs. And this is how vanilla Emacs looks like. This is not something I used to use. As you can see, Emacs greets you with this screen. I think the user experience improved since probably the earliest versions of Emacs because at least we have Emacs tutorial and guide tour on the greeting screen. Let's click on one of those links because I don't know, I never actually saw Emacs tutorial. Oh no, I actually saw that. But I accessed that in a different way. So there is a specific shortcut that uh, allows to access that tutorial. If you only start Starting to use Emacs, I really recommend you to just go through that tutorial. And it's, it's pretty straightforward tutorial. You just open it and you just read it. They explain you everything you have to do. Wait a second, maybe I have to have a camera on my fingers so you can see what I type. I think it's a good idea. Let me actually do that. I have a second camera. So this is the second camera. I'm going to move it here. I just realized that it probably doesn't make any sense to show you my keyboard because the keyboard doesn't have any labels in it. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm not going to go through the entire tutorial, but if you're just starting with Emacs, I strongly suggest you to go through the entire tutorial. It's really useful. It just teaches you the basics. So essentially what I'm going to assume is that you already know these basics and I'm going to show you how I configure Emacs with this knowledge. Okay, I'm going to close this buffer. Mm, yeah. So the first thing, I don't like that splash screen. Even though it's useful for the first time when you just start Emacs because it like have useful links, I don't like to see it all the time. So the first thing that I configure, I disable that splash screen uh, when Emacs is started. Most of the Emacs configurations start with .emacs file in the root of your home folder. So let's just create one. To open the file, we press Ctrl X, Ctrl F, which stands for find file. As you can see, it even says find file. And we just type .emacs. 
So this is the file that is going to be loaded up when we start Emacs. And you can put Emacs Lisp code here. So yeah, as you can see, it says Emacs Lisp here. That means this file is Emacs Lisp. If you don't know what is Lisp, Lisp is a weird language. <laughs> so you can Google what Lisp is. And it essentially looks like that. Emacs is configured in Lisp-like language, which is called Emacs Lisp. So what, what is really interesting about Emacs is that you can view Emacs as just an interpreter for Emacs Lisp. So what Emacs essentially does, it loads up and just interprets everything in your .emacs file. Everything we're going to put here is going to be executed when we loaded up our Emacs instance. So how do I disable the splash screen? I don't remember. Um, Emacs disable splash screen. Yeah, inhibit startup screen. It's just a variable that needs to be set up to true. And after that, the welcome screen of Emacs is going to be gone. So let's try to do that. And there's interesting thing. You don't have to restart your entire Emacs if you just edit a new expression to your Emacs configuration. You can just go to the end of that expression and press Ctrl X, Ctrl E, and it evaluates that expression in the context of the current Emacs. But in our case, we just need to check if the startup screen is actually gone. So we have to close Emacs and restart. So yeah, now, as you can see, there's no welcome splash screen. Another thing, I don't like toolbars and toolboxes, so I usually get rid of them. As far as I can remember, they are just modes. They are minor global modes. To disable, for example, menu bar, I have to do something like menu bar mode zero. And I can evaluate that with Ctrl X E and it's gone. And you can do the same thing with toolbar mod, and it's also gone. So I have an extra space for my text. Another thing that I usually do with my configuration, I like to make the font a little bit bigger. And I remember that the specific font is determined by variable, but I don't remember the name of the variable. So let's, let's just Google that. Max change font. And I really recommend to Google a lot of different stuff. Oh, okay. So this was not a variable. This was a function. So it's a function set default font and you can put uh, the name of the font. So let's just do that. Set default font. And I usually like to use Ubuntu Mono with the size around like 18 like that. Another thing that I would like to do is to have a different theme. I usually like a dark theme. Uh, so let's just go for that. I remember that there was like a function to change. I think it was called customize themes. Yeah, customize themes. And you can pick whatever you want. So let's just go through the themes and see which one is better. Okay, deeper blue. If I go back, it's a little bit better. So let's go with it. This is where it gets weird because as you can see, sometimes I configure my Emacs like by editing the file, but sometimes I can configure it like with user interface and I can save my change. Yeah, yeah, so, and it modifies my configuration. So yeah, it's kind of funny. Sometimes you edit your file, sometimes it's edited for you. And it gets so annoying when you have your Emacs configuration under version control and Emacs sometimes try to edit your configuration in a way you don't want it. And it's under version control. You can see that in Git stage stuff like, it's so fucking annoying. Emacs auto saving system can be pretty annoying when it create new backup files. Is there a way to dump them in a specific file or something? So yeah, this was a discussion in the chat and this was the answer. I'm going to put that in my like configuration because I think it's pretty, it's pretty useful. So parentheses are unbalanced. Oh, it's not parentheses. It's uh, quotes. Okay. Maybe it was supposed to be called saves, I think. So we have other questions in uh, YouTube chat. Or what do you use for navigation? I'm a noob in Emacs, but I've noticed that your navigation completion is different than default when you press Ctrl X, Ctrl F. It's a really good question. So I use Edo, Emacs Edo. I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. I think it's Ido. It's interactively do things. As far as I remember, you just enable that and it sort of works. Edo mode. 
Yeah, so you just enable it and it allows you to autocomplete stuff in a really cool way. Ida mod one. But either works only with files as far as I concern. I want to use the same for Meta X and yeah, for Meta X, the, like we don't see such thing, but for Meta X, there is such thing as Smex. Smex is essentially IDO or IDO for Meta X. I'm not sure if it's available out of the box or you have to install it. Let's just check it. So Smex. So it's not available out of the box. So we have to install it. We have to use Emacs Package Manager. To start Package Manager of Emacs, we have to invoke command package list list packages. <laughs> yeah, it's it's list packages. It queries the remote repo of Emacs packages and allows you to pick which package you want to install. So we need Smacks. So let's just find it. Smacks. And this is really interesting. There is no Smacks in the default repo. I believe that the default repo is called Elpa. Emacs Elpa. But nobody uses Elpa. There's not so many packages there. Cool kids use Melpa. They have a pretty simple explanation on how to set it up. Essentially, you just have to add their repository to packages archives. And that's pretty much it. So let's just go back to our configuration thingy and just copy paste that here. And <laughs> yeah, this is something new. As you can see, Emacs already edited our configuration. It edited this thing. The thing that we didn't ask for, but I mean, I like Emacs, but sometimes it's annoying. Okay, so we added that thing. So let's just evaluate it. Now we have a second repository of Emacs packages. So let's invoke list packages again, and we will see more packages there. Let's try to search for Smacks. And here's the Smacks. Okay, to install that package, we have to press I. This essentially marks that package as the package that we want to install. And we press X to actually apply the changes that we requested. Okay, it contacts the Melpa and installed it. So now it's installed, but I'm pretty sure we have to configure it properly. Okay, so you can essentially just remap the global MX to SMAX. Okay, so there's a function uh, global key binding. It requires a key and uh, the function that will be invoked when you press that sequence of keys. And this is kind of interesting. As already said, Emacs is just the interpreter of Emacs Lisp. And every action you can do in Emacs is just essentially some Emacs Lisp function that is invoked by pressing some key combination. Like everything, like it, when I go down, like press down, for example, this is down on my strange keyboard. There is a key binding and it invokes that function and we can even look it up. So there's a combination Ctrl H B and it shows all of the bindings in the current buffer. Yeah, here it is. In the current buffer, we have a binding for just one key down and it invokes function that is called next line. This is the function that moves cursor vertically down. What is interesting is that since it's a function, we can invoke it programmatically. So programmatically, we use the same function that is used when you actually press the key down. It's sort of a universal, like everything you can do in Emacs manually you can do programmatically. I can actually invoke that function next line. I just type that control X, control E, and it will evaluate the function and move my cursor down. And I can, for example, provide some argument, for example, 10. If I evaluate that expression, it will move my cursor down by 10 lines. You see that? And this is the same function that is invoked when I actually press down. Isn't that amazing? Like the, uh, how universal everything is in Emacs, even uh, down to such simple things. And you can track down everything. Like, you know that you press something, for example, enter, right? You know that you press enter, you can easily look it up. Enter in Emacs notation is red because it's a return. It invokes new line. You still can invoke that function, like new line and you invoke it and it inserts new line. You invoke it again, it inserts new line. So you can track down each individual function that is invoked in Emacs when you press something. Maybe it's the same for Veeam as well. I'm pretty sure it's the same for Veeam. So we need to remap the meta X. It's kind of interesting. So they have several bindings. So what I usually do, I just copy paste that chunk of code and forget about it. 
here it is we configured that um, and it's already pretty good so it's already usable i already like it what else can we can we install so i have a color theme gruber darky theme this is the color theme that i use all the time and it's available on Melpa. The most important thing, it's available on Melpa. And you can install it, just list packages and just find it there. Gruber, yeah, here it is. So just install it. Customize theme. And it's here. I just switch it. And yeah, there's sort of a like security check when you run like external unknown theme because it can execute some code. They sort of ask you if you really want to trust this code. Just say yes for everything. And yeah, this is how it looks like, and I like it. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. There is more that I would probably add, but I can do that if I actually start doing some work with Emacs. For example, if I start programming in Haskell, I'll probably have to add some Haskell configuration. It will start to program in C++. I will have to add C++ related configuration. But if I will do all of that, it will take hours and hours of video. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I really recommend to check my Emacs configuration. I'm going to put that link in the description. So yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. This is just my basic Emacs configuration, like something that is essential for my work. And I really hope you found it useful too. That's it for this video. And I see you on the next video, I guess.